Namaskar and good evening. Friends, as you know, India International Center and Research and Information System for Developing Countries, RIS, have partnered for last six months for this uh, series, which is focusing on banking and finance. In the pandemic world, we are going through a major financial challenge, and this is the reason why we started. I would request uh, Mr. Vora to give you the details. But at the outset, let me mention here uh, uh, how productive this exercise was. Uh, it was a great learning experience for both the institutions in terms of how we are going to go forward on this mega challenge that we are facing. It is affecting not only the Indian economy, but also our interlinkages with other mega global economies and the way issues are there before us in terms of industry, in terms of uh, the consumer interests, the uh, interests of pensioners, and also uh, the wider global world, which is looking forward for investments. And it is from this perspective, we thought uh, our today's uh, session uh, would focus on the idea of uh, resilient financial system and governance. Friends, in the times of COVID, we are facing major, major challenge in terms of governance. We are trying to make different kinds of endeavors for expansion of economy. We are trying to see how long-term gains are possible when we are leveraging the strength of uh, uh, productive sectors in the economy. We are trying to bring in uh, what is predictably uh, uh, sort of uh, shortcuts in terms of how we enable our industry to cope up with this challenge. We are seeing the loan moratoriums. We are seeing higher allocation to support the ailing sectors. We are also trying to give condition relaxations, which are important for loan recovery, lower and uncertain access to, uh, to external funding, and many other dimensions that are uh, requiring our attention. And in this uh, uh, milieu, it is important for us to see how our economy would be influenced. Fortunately, in the last couple of years, India has developed a regulatory architecture across sectors, be that in telecom or insurance and many other areas. And these regulators have performed rather well. They have uh, coped up with the crisis. Much more is desired, but definitely India is on the right track when it comes to these independent regulating authorities. What we are now looking for is in terms of uh, uh, bringing in uh, greater transparency, accountability, and all, of course, their preparedness for future. And, and, and uh, as I said, with the pandemic crisis, the nature of challenges are very different. The same regulatory yardsticks cannot be applied. With these relaxations that we are ending up with, how somebody like RBI should cope up with. And that's where we need new standards to come in. We need new thinking in terms of how this governance mechanism is further strengthened apart from also strengthening our endeavors for supporting economic growth. So we expect institutions like the Reserve Bank to manage the inflation, to manage growth, and also reduce the burden that uh, industry is going through. There is an excellent paper today's chair, uh, Professor Rakesh Mohan has come up with. Those of you who haven't seen should see this uh, excellent paper from his institute, CSEP, uh, Center for Social and Economic Progress, uh, which is their working paper three on third generation reforms. And this paper talks about precisely this idea of how institutions should be enabled to cope up and, and, and how we can really bring in a standard setting for these authorities and regulatory architecture that we need. When it comes to RBI, friends, the regulatory and, uh, and, and uh, monitoring role that we envisage uh, RBI is something which is, which is extremely important. Being on the board of the Reserve Bank, I am very closely watching uh, the uh, these performance and also the limited hands that RBI has when it comes to uh, uh, their DOS and, uh, and uh, DOR departments. So they are coping up with mega challenges with very limited hands. In last uh, uh, two years, they have launched a program called Utkarsh, which is trying to bring in uh, uh, several uh, new initiatives, a new cadre to, to monitor and, and bring in regulation. They are also trying to leverage the strength of technology. Uh, and and, and SubTech and RecTech are, are some of the initiatives they are working uh, with and trying to see how we are going to go forward. 
uh, but the uh, um, uh, dimension of this is getting further more complicated when multiplicity of actors is there. We find NBFCs, SSBs, private sector banks that are also entering in. So this plurality in economy, the reality of the multiple actors is making, even fintech, they all are making things extremely challenging. We are also very much uh, mindful of the fact that uh, the uh, recovery has to be greener. So, so when we are talking about uh, uh, build back better, we are talking about greener building. And that's where access to green finance, our connect with Basel norms, et cetera, we see in terms of how the uh, RBI can perform better, what, what is it that it can do. And, and this is why we requested uh, uh, the deputy governor uh, to spare his time and join us uh, uh, for this discussion. I'm extremely thankful to uh, uh, Mr. Jain for, uh, for joining us here today and, uh, and delivering uh, the lecture. I'm extremely thankful to Professor Rakesh Mohan, uh, who at the last minute has agreed to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, reshuffle some of his uh, prior commitments and join us uh, for this series. This is his second uh, participation in our six-part series that uh, IIC and RIS have partnered with. Uh, we are extremely privileged to have uh, one of our very eminent, well-informed commentator, uh, Ashok Bhattacharya. Uh, he, his writings have been so substantive and so well-informed that they are few to uh, meet the quality AKB has maintained over many, many years. So thanks, AKB, to uh, join us today. And now, without further ado, let me invite uh, uh, Vorasap, uh, no introduction. He's president of India International Center, one of the most accomplished uh, uh, civil servant of our country and, and, and one of the leading intellectuals when it comes to governance. So I thought it would be good to invite Vorasap here. In fact, he, he is, uh, uh, he's the most important uh, person who could uh, bring these two institutions together for this series. So what is up, floor is yours. Sir, please unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank yes, you. Sir. Yes, yes, sir. Well, thank you once again, Sachin, for your kind observations. I welcome particularly Dr. Rakesh Mohan, whom I am seeing on the screen after more than a quarter century. And I recall the good days when at my request he used to come and speak at the IIC on various topical issues of that time. I welcome, very warmly welcome the other two distinguished panelists. And as uh, Dr. Chaturvedi just now mentioned, while IIC in the normal course through the year organizes uh, discussions, seminars on identified important economic issues, RIS happens to be a specialized institution and they do their work uh, through experts, through academia, through the governmental institutions and they produce papers, they, they make valuable contributions. Uh, as it happens, Dr. Chaturvedi has been my colleague on the Board of Trustees of the IIC for the past four years. And when he was completing his tenure, uh, he was kind of saying farewell to all. So I said, that won't do. Uh, let us do something which is of a somewhat lasting nature. And uh, so he very kindly came forward with certain ideas, which led to this six-part webinar series. Now, these are intended, uh, have been intended, and already materialized. This is, today is the last one, the sixth one. We began on the 20th of January this year. Uh, all the subjects so far discussed, uh, I dare say, through some very eminent experts and specialists, have related to crucial, important, policy issues in the arena of banking and finance, or finance and banking in the larger spectrum of economic uh, activities. And uh, these various discussions have been uh, extremely useful. And I compliment Dr. Chaturvedi for 
very promptly producing reports on the substance of these discussions. And these reports have been put on the net, also printed. And I very much hope uh, that our uh, good friend from the RBI and other academics would have had some time to look at these reports. Because personally, as a non-economist, I feel that they, they have a great deal of uh, value in terms of uh, contribution to policy making. Now, as uh, Dr. Chaturvedi has mentioned briefly, um, I don't have to say it, I'm in the midst of uh, five eminent economists. It doesn't lie in my mouth to say things which uh, they know far, far better. But I would say that in the challenges which face our country, the biggest is the pace at which we achieve economic development, economic growth, the pace of our uh, wealth uh, generation, pace at which we are able to create employment, most of all. Uh, these are the challenges. These, these were being faced in a somewhat uh, vigorous manner till, till uh, early 20, when COVID came. And uh, that has upset uh, the whole scenario. And we have been on the downturn now for almost uh, a year and a quarter. Now, our erstwhile challenges in the so-called normal times have been multiplied many folds because of what COVID has done to us. Amongst other things, this pandemic has added several hundred million to the unemployed workforce and created varied multiple economic issues problems which create a great deal of distress to the ordinary person. Uh, Dr. Chaturvedi and his colleagues and the panelists in the earlier discussions have been looking at uh, the development finance institutions, their structures. Uh, how do we need specialized bodies to look at, to deal with the short-term goals, uh, medium-term goals, and the long-term goals? How do we accommodate the technological changes and challenges which also face us? The great digital revolution, the digital technologies, they also impact on the manner in which we work, especially in India. Since some of our problems are very, very much common to um, all parts of India and developing countries, and I dare say to large parts of the world, uh, so therefore, careful thought has been given in these discussions to propose or to recommend or to advise certain structural changes, reforms, which could lead to a more sustained flow of development finance, which could create stability, which could lead to, to um, continued investments, investments leading to very steady generation of uh, employment opportunities and so on. So all this has gone on, and I, I once again would like to thank RIS and uh, Dr. Chaturvedi for, for this very valuable partnership that we've had. <clears throat> now, I wouldn't say very much more because we have Dr. Rakesh Mohan going to speak to us and two other eminent panelists. Uh, but I will take this opportunity, Dr. Chaturvedi, to to particularly thank your good colleagues in your organization, uh, Dr. Dash, one of your academics, and then uh, in your own uh, head in your office, official kingdom, Mr. Manotra and uh, Mr. Krishnan. And in my own setup, I would particularly like to mention the very coordinating role played, very helpful role played by the director, the secretary, and uh, our chief of program division, Ms. Tete, and her associates, all of them have contributed very enthusiastically to materializing this series of webinars. So I will close there, Dr. Chaturvedi, and uh, uh, once again, uh, thank uh, all of you, particularly today's distinguished panelists. And uh, I have great pleasure now in calling upon Dr. Rakesh Mohan, whom I would look forward to meeting physically in the coming days, if all goes well, and uh, welcome him into the IAC and meeting and uh, talking about the old days. So now we have Dr. Rakesh Mohan going to speak to us, please. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Vora Saab, for your kind words. And it's a real pleasure to be at least in the same virtual room as you after so many years. And I do hope uh, able to come and see you at IIC before too long. Incidentally, this is my golden jubilee year of membership of the IIC. Um, in those days, uh, you could actually get membership uh, even as a student, which is what I did in 1971. Uh, now, of course, it's impossible to do that. Uh, but in those days, life was much easier in general. Um, and thank you very much, Sachin, for inviting me to be on this panel, um, both, of course, for reuniting me with uh, Bora Saab, um, to be on the same screen as sort of my one of my successors, many times removed uh, at the RBI, Mr. Chen, um, and of course, old friend, uh, old sinner, uh, old friend, uh, A.K. Bhattacharya. Um, let me just say a few words to uh, introduce the subject in a sense, and uh, then we'll look forward to hear Mr. Jain speaking. Um, first, uh, Mr. Jain, uh, congratulations on a reappointment. Um, uh, I've, if I may say so, we are one of the few countries which gives less than five-year appointments to governors and deputy governors. Um, in fact, uh, when I was there and Mr. Dr. Reddy was there, we were given five-year appointments, actually. Uh, all the deputy governors were there when I was there and the governor. Maybe we exercise too much independence. So the government has now stopped giving five-year appointments. Uh, Sachin, being on the board, I think you better tell the government that we are outliers in this. Uh, because central banks need stability, and you must have at least five-year appointments. And of course, people can be reappointed. Um, so we are a very, very difficult time, of course, as Bora Saab has mentioned, as Sachin has mentioned, um, and particularly for financial system resilience, which is the subject of today's talk by uh, by Mr. Jain. Um, this is particularly difficult for India because even prior to COVID, uh, we had been suffering from a high level of bad debt or non-performing assets. And uh, prior to COVID, say for three years or so, uh, the banking system with the new uh, Bankruptcy Act, um, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Act, that is IBC, all the various actions that the RBI took after 2015 or thereabouts, that we were in the repair process uh, in 2019. And then, of course, COVID broke. Um, so in some sense, we have a more difficult task than other countries uh, because we had this legacy in some sense before COVID. Um, as it happens, uh, uh, the RBI has actually been extremely active with, with a whole host of actions uh, related to COVID, uh, both in the monetary policies, the monetary policy sphere, the regulatory sphere, supervision sphere, um, also, uh, its role as uh, uh, banker and debt manager of the government, its role as uh, manager of the payment system, and so on. Um, as it and it just you, you would find in, in our website to, in the CSEP uh, website a paper by me on all the actions that RBI had taken until March 31, um, because it was written just before the end of March. Just actually, it was written just in, just in early April. Uh, so it is actually a remarkable uh, number of actions that the RBI has taken to protect the financial system from the ravages of COVID. Um, and now, of course, this was it was written prior to the second wave. So life has become presumably even more difficult after the second wave. Now, as the RBI's own financial stability report said in December 2020, that they expect the NPAs could possibly go up to 13.5 or 13.6%. Uh, in the latter part of this year, I would imagine it will be somewhat worse now because of the uh, because of the second wave. So this is a real challenge for the RBI to maintain financial system resilience and to see how it can protect the financial system from everything beyond everyone's control, quite frankly. Um, the So I, I look forward to hearing uh, from Mr. Jain how the RBI is planning to cope with this and keep financial system stable. The only one other thing I would say, and this was in reference to uh, what Sachin said in terms of the actions that RBI is taking to strengthen its regulatory and supervisory capacity. I happened to look at the data and found that uh, the number of professional staff in the Reserve Bank today, that is 2021, is lower than what it was in 2007-8. 
Um, and compared to almost any other significant country, it's the number of staff is really small. And the point is that in these 12, 13 years, uh, not only is the financial system expanded tremendously, but again, as Sachin was saying, it is trans it, there's huge transformations going on, whether it's fintech, um, now, of course, uh, threat of cryptocurrency, etc. So uh, there's a huge need, and like many other institutions, governmental or regulatory institutions in India, there's a huge need both to, 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 to enhance the technical competency of the staff to cope with the kind of thing you're going through. And second, also just numbers. Uh, I sort of make myself unpopular because among my economist friends, this, they sort of, when I say that, look, government of India is too small um, or that Indian regulatory authorities are too small, they said, you must be mad. But actually, if you look at the numbers, it is true. So uh, to, just to, as a final point, as I'm saying, that I'm very glad to hear that Reserve Bank is taking uh, active in, uh, sort of actions to strengthen its regulatory supervisory capacity, but it probably has to go much more and much faster. So with just those few uh, remarks, uh, Mr. Jain, uh, please, uh, we look forward to your address. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh Mohan, for inviting me for this uh, talk. And uh, I'm really thankful to uh, Mr. Vora and uh, Mr. Sachin for inviting me for this talk. Uh, while I have basically uh, structured my talk in a more conceptual manner, but I will definitely respond to the specific issues uh, for which I have been asked by Dr. Rakesh Mohan to respond as an RBI uh, representative. Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Warm greetings. At the outset, I thank India International Center for hosting this very important session on resilient financial system and governance when the resilience of the society itself is being tested by the COVID-19 pandemic. At a broader level, resilience is defined as the ability of a system, community, or society exposed to hazards to resist, absorb, accommodate to and recover from the effects of a hazard in a timely and efficient manner, including through the preservation and restoration of its essential basic structures and functions. I am confident that we as a country will resist, absorb, accommodate to and recover from the effects of COVID-19 very soon. Let me now touch upon the meaning of resilience of financial system. In the context of financial system, a resilient financial system is one which is able to absorb the impact of endogenous shocks it is exposed to, rebound quickly to original condition or adapt to new environment and continue to perform its role of providing financial services. This definition of resilient financial system is different from a stable financial system. A stable financial system is one which is able to absorb shocks, whereas a resilient financial system will be able to adapt and configure itself in response to a shock in addition to absorbing the shock. To put it simply, a robust system will be one designed to withstand a once in 100 years event, for example, an approach used in risk management. In contrast, resilience makes no assumptions about the magnitude of possible shocks, but rather looks to build systems that can deal with the entire range of shocks. As such, our efforts should be focused on building a financial system which is not just stable, but resilient as the type, source, magnitude, and frequency of so shocks are turning out to be highly unpredictable and non-measurable to a significant degree. Accordingly, Focus of, focus of regulation and supervision of financial system should be to make sure that financial system as well as individual financial institutions are not just able to absorb the shocks, but are able to adapt to the change circumstances. In this background, in last two years, various monetary policy action, the liquidity management, the regulatory and supervisory policies, and the macro fundamentals have reflected the action taken by Reserve Bank of India on all the fronts. And as Dr. Rakesh Mohan has uh, uh, told, 
that all these action taken by RBI post COVID-19 have already been figured in the public domain, including the CSCP. I would like to discuss some of the critical behavior because that is where uh, as a supervisor, we are observing a lot of issues and we have taken a lot of steps to really improve upon these particular aspects. I would like to discuss some of the critical behavioral and cultural issues, which if handled appropriately, have the potential to tremendously improve the resilience. First, let me talk about moral hazard, rather absence of moral hazard plays a substantial role in building a resilient financial system. Why would a bank invest in building a robust risk management system if it is aware that when push comes to show, taxpayers money would be used to rescue them? Shareholders of a bank will have incentive to seek better governance and risk management capabilities from the management of the bank only if their investments are at risk. Privatization of profits and socialization of losses is antithetical for building a resilient financial system. Similarly, employees of a bank should also have skin in the game. And in this background, we came out with our draft guidelines on governance. We came out with the final guidelines on the governance. We set up a committee and there were a lot of recommendation with regard to governance as well as the incentive structure. Uh, where that we have tried to put it out that how we can avoid the moral hazard at the various level, including the supervisory intervention proactively, even before the wrong things are happening that we have started. Let me come to the next point that resilience is a collective effort. Building a resilient financial system is a collective effort and cannot be left to the regulators alone. While the regulators contribute majorly by framing appropriate regulations, a tick box approach to risk management and compliance by the financial entities would mean that the market's wisdom is replaced with the regulator's wisdom. Regulations provide for minimum requirements to be met by the regulated entities. Hence, a resilient financial system requires contribution from all stakeholders and market discipline. Disciplining by depositors, Disciplining by borrowers and disciplining by investors is a necessary condition to achieve a resilient financial system. In this particular area, RBI came out with specific guidelines in terms of strengthening the assurance functions of various regulated entities, including the NBFCs, which earlier used to be the light touch regulatory regime. So we have come out with various regulatory guidelines for strengthening the assurance functions of these entities so that there are responsibility with all the stakeholders in the system. Now let me come to the information asymmetry. We call it lemon problem. Another important feature of building resilience in the financial system and improving the credit flow is reducing the incident of lemon problem, which would require improvement in governance at the borrower level also. If the lender cannot distinguish between the borrowers of good quality and bad quality, he will only make the loan at an interest rate that reflects the average quality of the good and bad borrowers. The result is that high quality borrowers will be paying a higher interest rate than they should because low quality borrowers pay a lower interest rate than they should. One result of this lemon problem is that some high quality borrowers may drop out of the market with what would have been profitable investment project not being undertaken. The lemon problem also impedes banks' ability to anticipate risk built up in their portfolios. Borrowers are probably the first ones to see early signs of difficulties in their respective segment. When they don't pass on the information to their lenders, fearing that the lenders may refuse new loans or tighten the condition of the existing loans, lenders' ability to identify risk early is severely hampered. And in this context, RBI came out with specific requirement on the risk management function of uh, various financial entities, including the guidelines to have a CRO for NBFCs having asset base of more than 5,000 crore. So we are trying to bring the regulation at par activity-based and entity-based. Second, during this COVID situation, we specifically advise all the financial regulated entities of RBI 
that they need to identify the idiosyncratic risk as well as the systemic risk in their organization. Through stress testing and through offsite uh, monitoring of their data and provide for well within the time. I'm happy to inform that when the banking sector entered into the COVID-19, those were very in a strong position when they entered to the COVID-19. And now also in the first wave of the COVID-19, the preliminary data suggest that in terms of CRAR that has been improved upon, the profitability has been improved upon, provision coverage ratio that has also been improved upon from the previous year and the gross NPA as well as net NPA has come down. So that is the improvement as far as COVID-1 position is concerned. Yes, COVID-2 position is having some challenging aspects and in various manners we are also dealing with it including the government of India through various steps. They are also ensuring that uh, uh, the smoothening of the impact of this COVID-2. In addition to that, we, are, we have also strengthened, uh, Dr. Rakesh Mohan raised this issue that uh, how we are making sure that our supervisory process is getting strengthened and the professionalism we are trying to bring in in the RBI. Let me respond to the supervisory part first. We have strengthened the supervisory process in last two years, shifting the complete aspects of reactive supervision to a proactive supervision, and that is how we have done it. We have created a separate structure, integrating all different departments and now making the structure based on the professionality of the financial entities, then based on the specific uh, sectors like banks, NBFCs and urban cooperative banks. We created two lines of uh, 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 structure within the supervision. One is horizontal and second is vertical. Horizontal structure used to do the off-site analytical of data and that data is being provided to our supervisors for on-site inspection as well as to deep dive in those regulated entities. And through this off-site monitoring and data analytics, including the preliminary stage of artificial intelligence of the data available with us, we are able to identify the idiosyncratic risk of the financial entity as well as the risk at the system level. And we were able to advise and guide those financial entities and the system well in advance to take care of all those risks which are getting impacted in their balance sheet or in their financials. So that is how basically this information asymmetry which presently is there uh, with the supervisor are being getting addressed as well as this information asymmetry whatever based on our analytics we are also sharing with our financial regulated entities so that they can take a well-informed decision including analyzing certain large borrowable accounts with regard to their future risk. Now let me come to various tools to ensure resilience. Having explained the concept of resilience let me delve into the tools required to achieve resilience in the financial system. The three A's model of resilience, though originally conceptualized in the context of climate change and disaster management, provides a useful template. The three A's of resilience are anticipatory capacity, absorptive, uh, absorptive capacity, and adaptive capacity. Anticipatory capacity could be thought of the ability of the financial system and its constituents to identify and measure emerging risk as early as possible and mitigate the risk by taking corrective action. Absorbed capacity is the ability to withstand the losses which may arise due to shocks which cannot be mitigated or avoided. Adaptive capacity helps in adjust to the new realities, be it change regulatory or economic conditions or a new competitive landscape. As I said earlier, with regard to the absorbing capacity, today, as on March 21, the preliminary data really suggests that there is a strong banking system in India, what it used to be a few years back. Today, we are on a better uh, uh, starting point. So that kind of absorbing capacity is available with the banking system, having a higher CRAR, capital adequacy ratio, and the capital available with them not only to absorb the losses, but also to have a growth capital. And second, the provision coverage ratio, 
which has increased substantially across all the sector, public sector, private sector, as well as the foreign banks in terms of their capacity to withstand the future shocks. The dimension of resilience, resilience of the financial system can be tested from many dimensions. Financial risk, operational and technological risk, competitive risk, climate risk, etc. And the financial system is required to anticipate, absorb and adapt to the same. Let me come to the financial resilience. The ability of banks to anticipate and absorb the financial losses during a crisis and remain solvent and retain their ability to lend is a measure of financial resilience. The Reserve Bank strives to ensure financial resilience of the institution that are regulated by it by prescribing a set of microprudential regulation, for example, minimum capital requirement, provisioning norms for bad debts, liquidity norms, etc. And particularly in last uh, two years, uh, very well balanced regulatory and supervisory policy decisions were taken and announced. Additionally, the Reserve Bank also resort to macroprudential measures when there is a system level risk built up, which may not be fully captured by the microprudential regulation aimed at resilience of individual institutions. While the prudential norms are aimed at improving the absorbed capacity of the individual institution, as well as the financial system as a whole, the anticipatory capacity of the banks requires to be strengthened by improving the risk governance in banks. The risk management function of financial institutions requires strengthening to be able to identify risk early and measure them with reasonable accuracy. It is important that the risk assessment process should include ongoing analysis of existing risk as well as the identification of the new or emerging risk as risk faced by the financial system keeps changing like this COVID, never envisaged. Banks which are able to anticipate risk ahead of others will also be able to raise capital ahead of others when the cost of raising such, such capital is low. Further. Banks with superior risk identification capacity may be able to better recalibrate their capital requirements and put capital to use in a more efficient manner. In addition to identifying current and emerging risk, financial entities should also perform stress tests to quantify their risk under various severe but plausible scenarios. This stress test should feed into their decision-making process in terms of potential actions like risk mitigation techniques, contingency plans, capital and liquidity management in stress condition. While the anticipatory and absorbed capacity of the individual financial institution enhance their resilience at the system level, Reserve Bank has also enhanced its own anticipatory capacity by improving its supervisory processes. As, as, as I said earlier, well before the time, we advise the banks and other financial entities regulated by us with regard to the emerging risk, which is on the forefront and how they can deal with it. And that's how they were able to sail with this uncertainty and the problem in a proper and a balanced manner. RBI has also taken various measures to identify the risk at the systemic level including the data analytics, as I said earlier. Now, let me come to operational and technological resilience, because that's also very important and which was demonstrated during this COVID-19 time, particularly with regard to the availability of the financial uh, uh, services and the payment services. The COVID-19 spread and the public health responses to the pandemic, including the social distancing and lockdown measures, tested the operational and technological resilience of the financial system like never before. However, it is a matter of great satisfaction that both the Reserve Bank and the financial institutions demonstrated tremendous operational resilience and ensured uninterrupted availability of financial services to the general public by putting in business continuity plans. The Reserve Bank ensured that the payment systems were functioning normally and also monitored the availability of digital banking channels on daily basis. The governor in earlier statements have told at many times that the way Reserve Bank of India created a 
separate uh, facility to ensure the uninterrupted payment facilities that was really uh, remarkable we created a dedicated uh, uh, team and uh, isolate uh, in isolation and that was the test of the best bcp ever in the time of crisis another equally important development though not as sudden as the pandemic is that of growing reliance of financial institutions on technology and technology resilience is now regarded as important as financial resilience if not more important even prior to the pandemic the reserve bank has been focusing on ensuring cyber resilience of financial institutions the reserve bank determines the cyber risk score for each bank using various key cyber risk indicators the reserve bank has issued various instruction for example cyber security framework cyber security controls for third party atms switch providers reserve bank of india digital payment security control direction 2021 aimed at improving cyber resilience of the system in order to enhance the ability of top management of banks to appreciate the issues surrounding cyber resilience certification awareness program on cyber security was mandated for board functionaries senior management and cxo banks i may also inform uh, to the house in the gathering that during this covid period we conducted various training program at the cxo level and the board level and more than 2500 participants were imparted the awareness and the training on the cyber resilience and the importance of the cyber security now let me come to competitive resilience the way technology is changing the pace and the way the traditional banking is really uh, becoming or fading out very fast and quickly even as the bank's reliance on technology has grown leaps and bounds technology is also revolutionizing the competitive landscape in financial system entry of big tech firms and innovative fintech players into the traditional domain of banks has already revolutionized the way the financial transactions are carried out unbundling of banking services is a reality and will change the way banks operate this will test the adaptive capacity of the banks and other traditional financial firms unless the traditional firms adapt to the new ways of doing business they may be marginalized very soon however even while individual entities adapt to the new competitive landscape at the system level it is imperative to ensure that the heterogeneity is preserved a homogeneous financial system will be less resilient and prone to systemic crises if the underlying economic condition change hence it is important that the financial system consist of entities which follow different business models even while adapting to the newer ways of doing business so here i would just like to mention one thing what basically rbi has done it as a proactive supervision we are now focusing on the business strategies and the business model of various banks and wherever we are identifying that the business model the business strategies and the business decisions are not interlinked we are pointing it out and we are not only pointing it out we are ensuring that these are addressed properly and in couple of cases it has been implemented successfully and we are able to see not only their market cap has gone up in the recent past in last one year rather uh, uh, their depositors interest and other stakeholders interest was also preserved let me come to the very hot topic of climate resilience and that is the hot topic across the globe where the central banks are also talking about it whether it should come within the domain of the central bank or it should be within the domain of the uh, respective governments but nevertheless financial system is having an impact on the climate uh, change so climate is fast emerging as a key risk driver for financial system while insurance companies directly face the climate risk banks are also required to take into account the climate risk more seriously climate risk can impact the financial sector through two broad channels physical risk arising from specific weather events and long term climate change and transition risk emanating from the efforts taken to address the climate change the fallout could include deterioration of asset quality of borrowers 
in affected geographical zones, the impact on business models due to governmental societal response to climate change and long-term liquidity effects. Increased frequency of natural disasters and climate extremes have a direct impact on the operational resilience of banks, especially in the context of increased reliance on centralized technology platform and data centers. There is a constant need to assess the climate risk and mitigate the same. In addition to mitigating operational risk arising out of climate extremes, there is a need for the financial system move towards green financing, even while keeping in mind the developmental requirement of the country. While as of now, RBI has not come out with any regulatory prescription, but we are evaluating all those aspects. And then at the appropriate time after evaluating all the things, a call may be taken. Now, let me come to the last topic, the governance. In the recent past, we have seen the failure of the banks, including even the post GFC also. The major concern of failure of financial entities and institution was mainly confined to the governance. And in that context, RBI has taken a lot of steps to improve the governance. But nevertheless, as I said earlier, the regulation is only a minimum requirement, but it is the responsibility, collective responsibility of all the stakeholders to improve the governance, being these are highly leveraged entities. In my view, what lies at the core of these three capacities, which enhance the regime, which I said earlier, anticipatory, absorptive and adaptive, which enhance the resilience of an entity is a good governance framework. More often than not, excessive risk exposures, credit losses, liquidity problems, and capital shortfall stem from weaknesses in corporate governance, compensation policies, and internal control systems. That is where I said that uh, we have addressed all the three issues in some or other manner. And one more thing, as part of the supervision, now we are focusing on conduct risk as a separate risk assessment as part of our total risk assessment of the financial entity, which basically is talking about the governance and the conduct risk. And there we are, uh, are trying to evaluate the risk of the financial entity where they lies. While high quality governance acts as credible defenses against risk, past experience suggests that weaknesses in corporate governance can cause failure of a financial system and may lead to financial instability. Several inquiries and studies have concluded that one of the significant reasons behind the global financial crisis of 2007-9 was that of weaknesses in corporate governance at financial institutions. The world also witnessed failure of governance structures, which necessitated the overall of interstate benchmark setting process. Given that the sources of future vulnerabilities are hard to predict, banks need to have robust framework of risk governance and management to identify and understand emerging risk and their potential impact for the firm. This remains one of the most important factors for bank resilience, particularly given ongoing changes in the business lines, market practices, and financial technology that may test banks' governance and risk management. Further, corporate governance is increasingly a major factor in the investment decision-making process Poor corporate governance is often cited as one of the main reasons why investors are reluctant or unwillingly to invest in companies in certain markets. It can also explain why in some economies, the shares of many companies trade at a significant discount to their true value. Even better governed companies are tarred with the same brush, almost a case of guilt by association. As such, banks' ability to raise capital which is important to improve their absorptive capacity is also a function of strength of its corporate governance practices. Good corporate governance in financial intermediaries is also an important detriment, uh, determinant of efficiency in allocation of resources and protection of shareholders' interest. Governance quality depends substantially on two elements, and that is where uh, now we are focusing as part of supervision, governance structures and culture. While it is possible for the government or reserve bank to enact laws, regulation to prescribe governance structures within a bank or other financial entities, 
appropriate culture is something that cannot be legislated banks and the boards have to develop the desired culture within the organization a sound risk culture bolsters effective risk management promotes sound risk taking and ensure that emerging risk or risk taking activities are recognized assessed escalated and addressed in a timely manner while the culture influences the decision making within an organization it is hard to assess nevertheless a structured framework should be put in place to assess the risk culture within banks and incorporate the assessment into the supervisory rating of the banks that is where i said that now we are focusing on the governance and the conduct risk where the culture is one part of it to make assessment of supervised entities the focus is on the bank's norms attitude and behaviors related to risk awareness risk taking and risk management another important element of governance framework which has significant effect on resilience of financial institution is the compensation policies and very recently we came out with the revised policies a compensation structure which rewards short term risk taking without consideration for long term risk or negative externalities may endanger the resilience of the individual institution as well as the systemic resilience at the same time inadequate compensation also has the effect of not sufficiently incentivizing the top senior management of financial institution in developing the capacity of the financial institution to anticipate absorb and adapt to the various shocks faced by the financial institutions now let me conclude just in a minute it may not be an overstatement to say that financial system in india and other jurisdiction are witnessing rapid shift in the operating environment characterized by changing competitive landscape automation and increasing regulatory supervisory expectation the source nature frequency and magnitude of risk are also continuously changing the reserve bank of india has put in place various regulations to improve the governance in banks and make them more resilient in addition banks have also made improvements in their risk management capacities yet the changing operating and risk environment requires banks to be vigilant strong and agile so as to identify risk early absorb the shocks and be able to adapt to the newer ground realities i am hopeful that banks and other financial institution in india will rise to the challenge continue to demonstrate their resilience and be able to contribute to a 5 trillion economy and beyond thank you very much thank you very much uh, mr jain uh, for that very very scholarly and thoughtful address uh, talking about the very broad features of financial resilience uh, the sources of risk and how the financial system overall has been changing and how you said at the end the source nature frequency and magnitude of risks has been increasing and a uh, window into some of the measures that the rbi has taken over the last few years to make the financial system more resilient uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for your remarks ashok all yours okay thank you dr mohan uh, and thank you uh, professor chaturvedi for inviting me to this session uh, mr vora thank you for having me here and uh, mr jain for a wonderful presentation that really outlined the contours of the challenges that lie ahead of the of india's financial system uh, i must compliment to the organizers uh, of this uh, session uh, to zero in on a subject and with the definition of resilient financial system and governance now this itself uh, in a sense uh, gives you an idea and uh, makes you uh, come to this broad sense that resilient financial system and governance are very much interrelated in the sense that a key to achieving resilient financial system is to have a proper governance structure and since i would be uh, i would be uh, making only special remarks and in the interest of time uh, i would uh, point out that uh, if governance Uh, uh structure is not fixed then i would say uh, to hope that the financial system will become resilient will be a misplaced uh, idea because in the sense that without governance i don't think you can ha ever have 
uh, resilient financial system. Now, let me uh, recall uh, what uh, Mr. Jan uh, uh, said uh, in, in his, in his uh, lecture. He talked about how resilience is a collective effort. Now, and uh, I entirely agree with Mr. Jan that it is a collective effort. Uh, and, uh, and, and I would say that the central point um, in my, you know, underlying my, my, my special remarks would be uh, that you cannot possibly think of a resilient financial system without a proper evaluation of the role of the government. I think the government is, is a very important player in this entire, entire uh, assessment of a resilient financial system. Uh, it is too big, you know, the, as they say that uh, the elephant in the room is the government here. And I think we must try to understand how the role of, the, of a resilient financial system will get influenced, get modified, get underlined by the kind of relationship the financial sector enjoys with the government. I mean, whether it is a, a, the relationship uh, is, 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 is uh, giving, the government is giving adequate autonomy, uh, is it fixing enough responsibilities? So I think that the governance structure is, uh, 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 to a great extent, is not an internal challenge for the financial sector, but also a challenge that arises from the way the government manages and gives autonomy and yet expects the financial sector to deliver on, on the promises that the financial sector regulator is supposed to make. So I think the, the, the role of the government, the relationship between the government and the regulator are a very, very important parameter that must be judged. And, you know, um, uh, Mr. Jan, I'm, I'm quoting Mr. Jan again. Mr. Jan talked about a moral hazard where is the, is the, is the, is the taxpayer's money being used uh, to, to, to privatize profit uh, and socialize losses. So I'm just summarizing him a bit. Uh, forgive me, Mr. Jan, if I have misunderstood, uh, misunderstood you or misrepresented you, but that's the sense I got. And therefore, it, it actually it reiterated my, my belief that if you cannot uh, uh, make sure that the relationship between the government and the financial sector is one that the government sets the policies and the regulator sets the regulations and there is mutual cooperation, but there are very few instances, unless the policy requires it, uh, interference or interventions by which the resilience of the financial system, the three A's that he talked about, gets undermined. That's point number one. Point number two, in my view, is that, you know, we keep talking about the financial system and we often believe that the financial system is consisting only of banks and there is only one regulator. I think the financial system, particularly in today's world, is an interconnected sector wherein uh, taking from even the way the stock market is financed, the insurance sector, the mutual fund sector, and, 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 and you know, so therefore there is need for a, a more integrated approach to, to ensuring that the financial system remains resilient. If you just focus on the banking sector, my sense is and my fear is that we'll probably not be able to assess the real challenges that lies ahead of the economy. After all, this is, you know, I, I mean, we, uh, some years ago, there was this, the inter-regulatory body financial sector um, uh, development council. Uh, and I think uh, it, uh, it, uh, uh, that system uh, continues, but I, I don't think it, sh it remains as, uh, as vibrant and as uh, relevant uh, to ensuring that the inter-sectoral uh, uh, regulation is done, ensured in a manner that the interconnectivity between the insurance sector, the mutual fund sector, the stock markets and the banking sector, they are kept in mind. So if you are looking at a resilient financial system, you need to look at a better governance system. A better governance system would mean a more healthy and prudent and transparent relationship between the government and the financial sector regulators. And then not just focus only on the banks, but also to the entire financial sector. So that's, that's, that, that's my point number two. And point number three is 
that uh, the is and and that is my final point is that the 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 government right now is looking at uh, privatizing public sector banks. Uh, you are uh, you know privatization is a is a big uh, big uh, target big goal that is sought to be achieved by the government which is fine. Um, uh, but the question that needs to be asked is that what kind if you are privatizing banks then and if there are fewer public sector banks what kind of a uh, governance structure change and when i say governance structure i am not meaning internal governance structure i am meaning the external governance structure do you still need a department of financial services in the government uh, so therefore if you are looking at uh, private banks do you need to strengthen the capacity of the the regulators that exist in the open which is the rbi or do you want to have a kind of a semi uh, you know uh, uh, semi parallel regulation that is done by the department of financial services in the government so uh, that uh, is is probably a challenge that is is equally important and it is important uh, to be dealt with uh, and i will stop there and uh, and, and 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 let uh, uh, dr mohan take over and 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 raise further issues thank you thank you very much ashok for uh, really uh, very uh, insightful comments uh, on Mr. Jain's uh, talk, uh, and of course, at the same level of, of in some sense, philosophical level, general level, that he talked. Um, Sachin, should we uh, first maybe ask Mr. Jain to respond to uh, Mr. Bhattacharya? Or, That's yeah. right, sir. Perfectly. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, with regard to this integrated approach of various financial regulator, as uh, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya has raised this issue, Financial Stability Development Council is meeting regularly, and we do interact quite often various issues. And particularly, there is a subcommittee of the Financial, Sta uh, financial Stability Development Council, which is chaired by the governor. And now we are convening these meetings on a quarterly basis. During COVID itself, many meetings were conducted and we had taken a consolidated view with regard to dealing with this COVID challenges. In addition to that, there is integ uh, integrated regulatory forum where the representative of various financial regulators are there. In the recent past, we have enlarged the scope of that IRF to discuss various stress entities even not when they are into stress, even if there is any visible stress also, and there is an interaction on various policy and other issues. With regard to second point on the capacities of regulator, whether there is a privatization or uh, it is a public sector structure, while I will not be having any comments on the privatization of PSB and all that as of now, uh, but with regard to capacity of the regulators, I don't feel that it uh, varies a lot. Rather, it, it, it doesn't have any impact because the regulatory and supervisory capacity and the resources are the same and the regulations are now ownership neutral. Wherever we were having the different regulation for the public sector entities, including the NBFCs, now we have more or less brought them at par with the ownership neutral uh, regulation. And that is where. With regard to supervision, Supervision rather was intense in case it is a public sector and now we have rather enlarged the scope to the private sector as well. Not only the banks, even the NBFCs. So from the capacity viewpoint, that is what my response is. One question Dr. Rakesh Moon also raised that uh, while the supervisory capabilities as well as the number of professional staff has come down, a valid uh, point and uh, a very valid question. And uh, we also did a lot of uh, uh, study and analyze in during last couple of years. Two way we are handling it. Number one, that the capacity building and the capacity enhancement. The capacity building and capacity enhancement, uh, we came out with the College of Supervisor. And that uh, earlier during COVID time, it started virtually. As of now also, it is virtual. But our basically intent and vision is that we have to set up this college of supervisor, not only to enhance and upskill the Indian supervisor, even to provide these services to other Asian countries as well. So that we have started. Second, 
to make an assessment of the gap in the resources as well as the skill gap in the present resources and the required resources very recently we have floated an rfp where we are going to engage a consultant who is having an international experience of dealing with cent central banks and regulator and supervisor to advise us and guide us that how we can really enlarge our uh, resources as well as enhance our skill sets so thank you this is my response thank thank you very much uh, mr jain um if you permit uh, let me come down to earth from the very high level philosophical uh, and principles based discussion that you gave which is very valuable so i'm not i think that is very very useful i think for all of us to get an understanding of the principles uh, behind uh, so many of the actions that the rbi is taking to enhance the resilience in the international system but uh, coming to the present time in terms of what we will the, the issues that will come up in the next few months couple of years whatever one that we saw after the north atlantic financial crisis by the way i always call it north atlantic financial crisis the rbi should never say the global financial crisis because it wasn't global uh, we did not have a financial crisis 2008 9 because we were much better in terms of regulation then uh, in fact not just india but uh, this is no, no bank went down in any country in asia latin america or africa in 2008 9 it's only the self centeredness of the west that when there's a north atlantic financial crisis they call it global when there's an asian crisis like in 96 97 they call it asian and not global that's by the way um, so uh, when we had the north atlantic financial crisis one of the things that the rbi did was a large degree of regulatory forbearance and as a consequence of which npas didn't come to the fore till the aqr that as asset quality review in 2014 if, if i'm not mis i think 2014 uh, not 2013 yeah 2014 now my question really, and, and therefore we got into some trouble in the sense that we did not recognize the npas as they arose 2011 12 13 and we finally recognized them uh, after the aqr in 2014 uh, and then of course all the action started to deal with the issue so my question is th that today again for good reason i have no difference at all with the regulatory forbearance being done because i think it's necessary uh, given the situation with covid um, and the other measures that went with covid in terms of health measures uh, lockdowns etc so there's no choice but to do regulatory forbearance Uh, and also the debt moratoriums that have been put in place which again are necessary so but my question is that um, does the that what i would hope is that while this is being done the rbi itself has enough information to know what is the level of actual npas or likely npas so that it can do contingency planning for whatever may arise once the regulatory forbearance is lifted once the uh, debt moratoriums are lifted so uh, that's one specific uh, uh, question and related to that of course is uh, that we had also suspended the functioning of the ibc uh, i understand that's been brought back now if i'm not mistaken uh, and again the question is that will there be a flood of uh, issues that will come to the ibc uh, after the moratorium after covid after the regulatory forbearance is lifted and moratoriums etc and same thing in the uh, in 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 the context of the bad bank uh, how what is the progress in the setting up of the bad bank um and finally uh, one issue to do with possible future financial instability that given the current uh, low interest rates which again i have no difference with because i think it's necessary in the current circumstances however it is the case that most interest rates now are real interest rates are negative our real interest rates are possibly lower than even the western economies and that can give rise to financial instability in the future I, I, once again i want to repeat that i have no difference with this policy because i think this necessary today uh, but the question is uh, how much are we thinking of the possible consequences on the financial system uh, thank you dr rakesh mohan let me try to respond as far as this gfc and north atlantic financial crisis uh, 
I stand corrected. In future, I will use that way. So that's not an issue. Now let me come to this uh, regulatory forbearance. What was given post uh, this North Atlantic financial crisis, and what regulatory forbearance has been given the post COVID nineteen. Uh, and uh, as you have said, and various other economists have analyzed, including the analysts and the credit rating agencies. Now there was a fine balance between the prudence of the regulation. as well as the real sector economy to bring back the uh, those uh, entities into the economic development uh, front and that is where this was not like this uh, cgr and other prudential uh, uh, forbearances which were given with regard to the data we do collect the data on a regular basis and that is where i told that uh, now we have sharpen our uh, Our uh, skills, as well as the data analytical capabilities, and in the future also we are going to do it, where we are uh, uh, trying to get a uh, pull mode process uh, for collecting the data from various financial entities. So we have done it. Uh, being these numbers are not available in the public domain, so I will be constrained to give the numbers, but definitely I will give an indication of those numbers. whatever number we have tracked whether it was because of the moratorium or because of the supreme court judgment or where we provide the resolution framework one to the uh, various set, uh, stress entities we had collected the data it was not having larger impact on the financial sectors gross np or the future nps and that's why i said that the preliminary data on the published number basis as well as on the unpublished number we have arrived at that the total gross npa of the scheduled commercial banks may end up little bit lower than march 20 despite of factoring all those uh, moratorium and other issues for nbfcs it may slightly go up but not out of the range so it is well within the range but may slightly go up. and whatever data we collected because of the moratorium and the resolution framework was not large enough and wherever after the invocation because the invocation date was 31st december the implementation in retail sector has already happened which is about uh, 75 to 80% of the invoked uh, uh, numbers and that's also not very large now let me come to ibc suspension it was required at that point in time but now we are not seeing any flood of the ibc probably the reason may be that by and large we are able to see that the stress on the corporate sector uh, has been managed well and it has been recognized by and large i am not saying all but by and large corporate sector stress even before covid 19 was recognized and during covid 19 whatever was left out was recognized it is not large yes we are able to see the stress somewhere in msme as well as in the retail segment that is where we are able to see but not in the large corporate side so that's why there may not be any a uh, large number of cases reference to the ibc or the nclt with regard to setting up of the bed bank uh, uh, the government has uh, already announced the process is on i understand uh, because uh, it's not uh, within our domain but i understand government is at very advanced stage uh, to really set up that bed bank and uh, shift those uh, bad assets Uh, from the public sector entities or maybe on the private sector entities to this bad bank structure low interest rate uh, for a uh, uh, longer time a negative real interest rate that is the reality and as a central bank as you have also said we have to prioritize depending upon the situation so the priority at this point in time is basically the growth and uh, the potential stress because of the low interest rate we have done one study not fully encompassing all the segment but we have started uh, with the corporate sector and particularly the listed entities that what kind of stress can built up and if that stress is there whether it is adequately covered with the returns so risk return uh, kind of a trade off a trade off we have seen and uh, in corporate segment uh, not large probably the reason may be because uh, for large number of listed entities the debt equity ratio has come down uh, the dscr and the interest coverage ratio has improved upon and probably there was a tendency to hold cash by this corporate entities so probably that may be the reason but definitely uh, we are monitoring uh, this aspect uh, that i can assure you
Thank you. Thank you very much for those very reassuring words, Mr. Jain. Um, uh, so do I understand it then that the kind of uh, expectation that the Financial Stability Review gave in December uh, was perhaps a bit too pessimistic? Uh, I won't say. Actually, uh, it, it, it is basically, as you know very well, that uh, there is basically on different scenarios. And based on those scenarios with one sigma and two sigma and three sigma and the severe uh, basically kind of scenario, those assessments were looked out. Now, last FSR, we have said in the FSR code also, it was two-stage process. And what two-stage process, because of moratorium, the reported numbers were not the real numbers. So the March number, whatever was reported, was not the real number. So we did basically extrapolation of those numbers and arrive at the September number, September 20. And then based on that September 20 number, we put the stress testing under various scenarios, three scenarios. So that is how it has worked. So uh, maybe some statistical uh, uh, issues because of uh, not having the reported, actual reported uh, uh, data uh, because of the monitoring. Thank you. Ashok, would you like to ask some questions? Uh, I only see one question from the audience, which is the importance of green financing in India. Uh, but Ashok, before perhaps Mr. Jain answers the green financing, Ashok, would you like to pose some questions? No, I, I, I have only one question about uh, the compensation culture as part of the, the resilience of financial system. Uh, and I did not get a clear sense from Mr. Jain that whether the compensation culture needs to, uh, is it okay now or is it should it get better? And if it has to get better, uh, what is the gap between what is the, what is the right optimum level and what is current now? Because that, to my mind, is a, is a critical issue as well to make sure that the compensation culture also comes on board. You know. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya, uh, that is where basically I covered in my address also. The compensation structure is very important on one side where it is excessive, on the other side where it is very low. So very low, we all know where it is there and that's why I covered it and uh, we have taken up uh, at the various forum also. With regard to where it is excessive, we came out with our guidelines where we have put a cap on the variable structure including the ESOP. So the fixed structure plus variable structure. And for whole time director, it requires approval from RBI with regard to fixed plus variable. Then we have put it out the variable component, how it has to be in a staggered manner so that it's not the short term risk. It is basically a long term risk which can be factored. And we put it out the clawback and the malus also in those guidelines. So it will be having a clawback provision and it will not be basically paid upfront. It will be paid in a deferred manner. So that is where we brought out these guidelines. I hope that with that, uh, it will not be very excessive to create more risk. And second point, as I told that in the risk management, because we are focusing on risk management, when there is a focus on risk management, the risk management should see the adequacy of the risk return. So unless until that is there, it, it won't help. And the third point where we are putting more and more emphasis is on the compliance. Because we have seen that the compliance in the financial entity is a little bit weaker. Uh, so we have put out uh, various uh, measures in place to ensure that the compliance has improved upon. And in a couple of cases, you might have seen in last uh, uh, few months and uh, uh, last year itself, where we were strong enough to take even uh, action as a business restriction against one of the largest private sector bank. Yeah, that's right. And just to want to add, uh, uh, Dr. Mohan had talked about the you know IBB uh, bankruptcy cases. The latest numbers are indeed very 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 low. You know, going by Mr. Sahu's latest statement, only 200 cases of insolvency cases have come up since 24th of March when the moratorium was taken off. You know, so 200 cases in the last two months is actually is, is nothing. You know, compared to what is to come earlier. Yeah. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes more. Uh, I don't know, Sachin, would you have any questions or thing you were able to raise or what else? I keep on doing that in the board meeting, so I don't spare any opportunity. 
But, uh, sir, I, I think uh, the uh, uh, sense that I'm getting from audience here, uh, a huge interest in green finance and uh, uh, Deputy Governor did uh, refer to green financing. I also see this issue of uh, uh, cost of, uh, of access to green finance. So I, I wonder if uh, Mr. Jain would like to respond to any of these issues. As I said that uh, whether we have issued any regulatory guidelines as of now, answer is no. We have not issued any specific guidelines and that is the debate going on uh, with various central banks also. Do we need to really encourage and come out with various regulatory prescription with regard to climate change and the green financing? Whether actually green financing has taken place, answer is yes, that we have seen in last uh, uh, five, six years, the green financing has improved upon against the non-green financing. That data we have taken, uh, though it's not very large, but definitely there is an improvement in the green financing. Then in addition to that, I think it is for the regulated entities to really examine and look into it because ESG model is really uh, getting more and more attention from the prospective investors. And they are willing to take the low yield if the score under the ESG is better. So I think it's for the regulated entities to really examine and see that from where they can get the more funds at the lower cost to build a sustainable uh, long-term business model. Thank you. Uh, Vora sir, any uh, views or questions you might have? Well, <clears throat> Dr. Kesh Mohan, the only observation I have is that uh, what has been discussed just now, the questions you raised and the answers that uh, Dr. Jain has given, that uh, while these relate specifically to the uh, financial sector management of uh, a larger the financial economy, I dare say that some of your concerns ex as expressed this evening are very typical and very common to the concerns that I have about governance at large, the governance of our country, some of the pressure points, some of our weaknesses, how they don't get attended in time, they enlarge into very large issues and then sometimes get out of control. But I'm glad to hear from Dr. Jan that things are uh, well under control and getting more under control and that we will have uh, better systems in the years to come because um, speaking in a very uh, uninformed manner, I would say that unless our financial sector, especially the development finance sector, works exceedingly well and we are able to push the required uh, injections of uh, monetary injections into the system and create the required job opportunities in the right numbers, then we have a very, very difficult task ahead. So from that perspective, I am very happy to hear what I've heard. And thank you very much for asking me to speak. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mora Sahib. Um, there's a question from a former Secretary uh, Economic Affairs, Mr. Gopalan. Um, one, he says, one problem is internal controls as it happened in PNB. How is this being addressed? And of course, this is topical these days with Mr. Choksi wandering around in the Caribbean. Uh, OK, let me uh, respond to it. As far as improving the internal control, now there are two, three aspects. One, that the risk-based internal audit. As I said, basically, there are three lines of defense. And Dr. Okesh Mohan uh, knows very well that uh, the business unit and thereafter the risk management, compliance, internal audit, and then external audit. And thereafter, the supervisory role comes. And if these defense lines are really having a short circuit, then the entire blame is passed on to the last line, which is the supervisor. So how to strengthen these internal, uh, internal defense lines? So one is that risk-based internal audit. And second is basically the compliance culture and the risk management. As I said, in the recent past, you must have seen that we have come out with various guidelines to strengthen the risk management by giving an independence to the CRO and even in the governance guidelines also, we have told that what should be the reporting line of the CRO, CXO level position, CRO compliance officer, as well as the uh, internal audit head. 
So that we have uh, told very clearly. Second thing we came out, which we have already uh, uh, basically put out in uh, uh, in statement earlier, that we have come out with the escalation matrix, supervisory action, escalation, supervisory action matrix to improve the compliance function. So earlier it used to be that uh, once it is a compliance, and that's why I address in my, uh, I covered in my address also, if it is a tick box compliance, then it means there is a shifting of the market discipline to the regulator. That, that's not appropriate. So what we have done basically in the compliance system, now we have put out a escalation matrix. If it is not responded, then displeasure letter, then penalty, monetary penalty, and the business restriction. And under that uh, basically escalation matrix, we have taken and demonstrated in one of the action where the action was very much visible. And that will really improve upon. The second point, uh, what we, uh, we have strengthened the communication, two-way communication with the statutory auditors. We brought out the guidelines also and the statutory auditor guidelines. We expect that it will improve the audit quality. It will avoid the conflict of interest also, which we have seen in many entities in the past. So that we have strengthened. And second, the two-way communication with the statutory auditors. Because the objective of both the uh, statutory auditor as well as the supervisor, that the financial statement should reflect true and fair position. So there is no point that if supervisor are identifying certain divergences, which is the, within the domain of the uh, central uh, auditor. So that is how we are uh, addressing in this manner with regard to the internal control. Now, what happened in PNB that may be said that it is a reactive approach because it was happening on the SWIFT and thereafter the SWIFT guidelines were issued. And that's why I came out on the cybersecurity resilience. We have not only issued the guidelines, we have basically created a template. And under that template, we are trying to capture that what kind of cyber resilience uh, the financial sector is having. The data speaks volumes about it in the uh, payment system and all other things. Our basically, though I'm not saying that uh, it is a complacency at the regulatory level, there is always a scope for improvement and we are constantly uh, doing that improvement part. But nevertheless, in terms of number, as well as in terms of amount, the fraud percentage in the digital payment system is much, much lower than the international benchmark. So, yeah, some instances can happen anywhere, but it is basically how we are learning, how we are plugging, and how we are improving the future finance, uh, future system. So that is where we have uh, taken a lot of action on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. We only have two minutes more. There is one question from Susubam. I don't know if you would like to take it up or not. How difficult is the emerging inflation risks versus low interest rates? Uh, I think I have responded because you also raised that question. In some manner, I have responded that. Ki basically, for any central bank, the priority is uh, to be decided. And uh, then priorities have been decided that at as of now and rightly so. Otherwise, it would have been a very uh, different uh, st future stress scenario. So presently, it is the growth. But nevertheless, we are not losing the sight to make an assessment of the uh, emerging risk or the future risk, which is arising in our at least regulated entities. So we are uh, regularly monitoring. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jain. Uh, I am very happy to see that the Reserve Bank is living up to its um, 90, 80, 87 year old traditions of professionalism and also skill in managing googlies by doing very deft glances. And that's in the context of the World Test Championship, <laughs> Test Cricket Championship today. So uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Jain and Vora Saab for inviting me and Sachin. Sachin, over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Professor Akish Mohan, for. Uh... Uh, not only uh, uh, chairing the session, but also uh, sharing with us uh, deep insights in terms of how uh, and what direction we are going in, uh, whether uh, India's regulatory system is really on track, what is required, and the key issues that Mr. Bhattacharya raised. Uh, uh, I think everybody would agree for three cheers for Mr. Jain, the Deputy Governor, and I think we all join uh, 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 chair of the session in congratulating uh, 
uh, Mr. Jain for his reappointment uh, as Deputy Governor for next two years. So, so our warm greetings. And uh, I think uh, my chair has very rightly mentioned that uh, the high standards of uh, professionalism and uh, commitment they bring in uh, great uh, confidence and also uh, our uh, commitment in terms of bringing other regulators at par with RBI. So this institutional strength of India uh, not only motivates many other agencies, but also I think inspires us to, to uh, uh, bring in excellence in the nature of regulation and management that uh, our public life requires. So thanks a lot, uh, uh, um, Deputy Governor Mr. Jain, for sparing your valuable time and joining India International Center and RIS platform uh, for discussing banking and finance. I also thank uh, our chair and uh, and our special uh, for special comments, Mr. Ashok Bhattacharya uh, from Business Standards for uh, uh, joining us and and sharing their insights. Thanks once again to all of our audience for uh, joining in, tuning in, and also bringing in uh, uh, some very stimulating questions. Uh, uh, so please uh, uh, do watch the uh, YouTube recording of this. The um, uh, link would be shared very soon. And we would also uh, request Mr. Jain to share uh, text of his lecture, which uh, the NRAS uh, and, uh, and India International Center would publish as our occasional paper. So thanks. Thanks once again. And very goodbye. With this, our six-part series comes to an end today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.